Today we are going to the early 20th century. So sit back as we go to the USA. Louise Peet was born Louise Pressler in Bienville, Louisiana on September the 20th, 1880. Her father worked as a printer, working long hours to provide for his family, while her mother stayed at home, raising the couple's three daughters. Louise was a middle child, and in her early teenage years, she would often misbehave and gained a reputation for being an unruly teenager. So when she was 15 years old, her father sent her to boarding school. Louise, however, found it hard to cope with the strict rules at the school, and she soon started to get into trouble. When three of her classmates discovered that some of their jewellery had disappeared, they reported it to the principal, and after a short investigation, the missing items were found in Louise's bedroom. She was expelled from the school and returned to Louisiana. But on her return, she found it hard to settle back at home and would always go out, often staying away all night. She met a man named Russell Anthony, who was nine years her senior. Soon after their first meeting, Louise and Russell got married and went to live in Dallas. Unfortunately, Russell didn't really know his young bride and Louise soon started stealing from shops. She would also go out with other men while he was at work. He soon realised that the marriage was a mistake, so the couple divorced and Louise once again returned to Bienville. In 1903, she met a man named Henry Bosley. He worked as a salesman and spent much of his time travelling. A few days later, Henry and Louise went to New Orleans and got married. It was not known why she wanted to marry so quickly again. It is possible that she thought that marrying Henry would improve her circumstances, but her life with her new husband became somewhat nomadic. She travelled with him and lived most of the time in boarding houses and run-down hotel rooms. Being a salesman, Henry worked on commission and his income varied from week to week, so he found it difficult to establish himself in one location and provide his wife with the luxuries she craved. When in Tulsa, residents at the boarding house the couple were staying reported that jewellery had disappeared from their rooms. The owner of the boarding house conducted a quick search of the premises and the items were soon uncovered in the room occupied by Louise and Henry. Henry apologised and used all his diplomacy and charm to defuse the situation, but the couple were instructed to leave their lodgings and made their way to Waco in Texas. It did not take long for Louise to again find herself in trouble when she attempted to steal from a local jewellery shop. This time the police were called and Louise was arrested. She was put in front of a judge where she gained sympathy due to her respectful manner and her tearful apology and the judge issued her with a suspended sentence. The couple continued going from town to town but Henry was aware that this wasn't the life that his wife wanted. He told her that he would try and find a more stable job but in the summer of 1906 he returned unexpectedly from a trip only to find his wife with another man. Henry was reportedly devastated and two days later he was found dead in a hotel near Waco with a .32 caliber pistol in his hand. The death was ruled a suicide. Louise then calmly sold her husband's belongings and moved to Boston and started working as an escort. She would go out with wealthy older men and took full advantage of her absent wives by stealing their jewellery. She then kept the items she liked and sold any that she didn't. She managed to stay in Boston for a year, but when one of her clients discovered what she was doing, she quickly left and returned to Texas. Not one to be alone for very long, she met a man named Joe Apple. He was a confident and brash person who gave the impression he was very wealthy. He wore smart clothes and diamond rings, and Louise was immediately attracted to him by his abundance of jewellery. They started to go out, but only a week after they had met, Joe was found dead. He had been shot and all his jewellery had been robbed. This time Louise was arrested. When she appeared in court, she told the judge that she had indeed shot the victim, but it was in self-defence, as he had been violent and abusive towards her. Not only was she cleared of the crime, 
She was then also applauded by the jury. She next met a hotel manager named Harry Farouts. It was now 1913 and everyone considered Harry to be a hard-working, respectable man. However, when jewellery and other valuable items started going missing from the hotel, the police suspected he may be responsible. Other staff members also suspected him, so as his reputation had been ruined, the police had no problem in declaring his death a suicide when he was found dead in his room with a revolver by his side. In 1914, Louise was living in Denver, where she met a successful businessman named Richard Peets. The couple soon got married, and in 1916, Louise gave birth to a daughter that the couple named Betty. Their marriage had its ups and downs, but Richard's business was successful, so Louise was relatively happy. Many thought that as Louise was now 36 years old, she had settled down and put her past behind her. But this was not the case. In 1920, the US economy went into a sharp deflationary recession. This resulted in a very difficult time for Richard and his business. So with their marriage far from perfect and Louise's living standards reduced, she decided to leave her husband and go to California. She arrived in Los Angeles and went about trying to find work. She was now 40 years old, and when trawling the situation vacant adverts in the newspaper, she came across one advertising for a housekeeper in a very large house in South Catalina Street. The owner was a widower in his 40s named Jacob Denton. He had made a lot of money from the mining industry, but had suffered the double tragedy of losing his wife and daughter to influenza a few months earlier. Jacob offered Louise a position, and the following day, she and her daughter moved in. It was obvious to Louise that Jacob was wealthy due to his large house, but she was anxious to know exactly how wealthy. So when she had the opportunity, she searched the room he used as an office and looked at all his private papers. She soon discovered that Jacob Denton was very wealthy indeed. She found bank books and lots of jewellery, much of which contained diamonds. As time went by, Jacob would ask Louise to accompany him to social functions, and to many, it seemed that they were a couple. So Louise sent her daughter back to Denver to live with Richard, as she tried to get closer to Jacob. At the end of May 1920, Jacob asked his niece, named Mrs. Almond, to conduct an inventory on everything in his house. He gave no reason why he wanted to do this, but it may have been that he thought that Louise had been helping herself to jewellery and other valuable items he owned. A few days later, on Tuesday the 1st of June, Louise asked the gardener if he would take some earth to the basement room as she wanted to grow some mushrooms. The gardener gladly carried out the request, but noted that he did not see Jacob and in the subsequent days and weeks, Many people noticed that Jacob was nowhere to be seen. A car salesman phoned the house, but Louise told him that Jacob had had an infection in his arm and it had got worse. She told him that he had had to have his arm amputated. She would tell different people different stories about his whereabouts, telling some he was in Portland, others he was in San Francisco. She also went to Jacob's bank and unsuccessfully attempted to access his safe deposit box. She then tried to cash a cheque, but as the signature did not match, the transaction was declined. When the bank official asked where Jacob Denton was, Louise replied that he went off with a Spanish lady. The question about his whereabouts continued to circle, and Louise told tales of how his arm had been amputated, and sometimes his leg as well. But they all ended up with Louise telling whoever was asking, that Jacob had gone away to come to terms with his amputation. Eventually, Jacob's daughter from his first marriage wrote to her cousin, Miss Almont, as her monthly allowance had not arrived. Miss Almont went to the house, but Louise told her that Jacob was away. Louise was now feeling a little concerned as she was getting so many inquiries about Jacob. 
so she told her neighbours that she was returning to Denver to try and reconcile with her husband. Meanwhile, Jacob's daughter told her mother, who was Jacob's first wife, about the non-payment of the living allowance. And not very satisfied with the answer that Louise had given Mrs. Almond, she hired a lawyer named Rush Bloggart to track him down. It was now September 1920, and the lawyer was very concerned about Jacob's well-being. He contacted the police and asked them to search the house on South Catalina Street. They soon came across the locked basement, and underneath a pile of earth that had supposedly been used to grow mushrooms, they discovered the decomposing body of Jacob Denton. He had died from a shot in the back. The police contacted their counterparts in Denver, and Louise Pete was arrested. Louise was transported back to Los Angeles and taken to the Glen Ranch police station. She denied any knowledge of the murder of Jacob and denied stealing his possessions. She blamed the mysterious Spanish lady and stuck to her story. On searching the house, the police discovered a .32 caliber pistol in an upstairs closet with one bullet fired. Louise continued to deny any wrongdoing, but she was nevertheless charged with the murder of her employer, Jacob Denton. Her trial started on January the 21st, 1921, and the prosecution produced many credible witnesses and dismissed the Spanish lady as someone Louise had made up. They also questioned Louise's claim that Jacob had given her all of his possessions to do with as she liked. The defence, however, called witnesses who testified that they had indeed seen the mysterious Spanish lady with Jacob Denton. Another said he had seen Jacob after June with one arm missing. Louise remained calm throughout the trial, but did not take the stand. On February the 17th, the trial ended and the all-male jury was sent out to deliberate. They returned four hours later with their verdict and found the defendant, Louise Pete, guilty of murder and the judge sentenced her to life in prison. Her husband Richard would regularly write to her, but in 1924, heartbroken and with a ruined reputation, he committed suicide. Life in prison, however, did not mean life in prison. And in 1933, Louise was transferred from St. Quentin to the new female prison in Tehachapi, where in 1939, her case was again put in front of the parole board. She had applied for parole before, but on each occasion it had been denied. But this time, her application was supported by the parole board and her social worker. A journalist named Caroline Walker heard that Louise was again applying for parole. So she wrote to the board and tried to convince them that she was too dangerous to be set loose on society again. Miss Walker added, that Louise had managed to exist all her life by stealing, by lying, and by violence. And if the parole board let her out, it would be tragic for someone. Emily Lathan, who was a parole board member, dismissed her concerns and told her colleagues that Miss Walker needs to believe that prison can reform a person. On April the 11th, 1939, 18 years after being convicted for murder, Louise Pete was released on parole. She took the name of Anna Lee and she went to work in a serviceman's canteen. Things seemed to be going well for her and in 1942, three years after being paroled, an elderly female co-worker disappeared. The police went to the co-worker's home and discovered it to be in a state of disarray. They contacted her best friend at work who the police only knew as Anna Lee and were told a strange story about the woman falling over. The police did not check out who they were talking to and had no idea that Anna Lee was really Louise Pete. A year later, in the summer of 1943, one of Louise's parole officers named Emily Lathan, who so vocally had supported her parole application, fell ill. So Louise moved to her apartment to care for her. However, Two weeks later, Emily Lathan died of a stroke. Louise seemed to be a reformed character, but she could not resist helping herself to Emily's .32 caliber pistol. 
Part of her parole conditions was that she had to work. So her friend named Margaret Logan suggested that Louise work for her to nurse her elderly husband, Arthur, who was suffering from dementia. This was agreed by the parole board and Louise moved in with the Logans. Margaret had known her for over 20 years and it was her belief that she was innocent of the crime for which she was convicted. Louise did not really like working, so tried to persuade Margaret to get her husband committed to an institution. Margaret considered this as her husband was getting more difficult to care for, but instead she gave up her job so she could work part-time in her real estate career and free up more time to look after Arthur. Margaret had come to trust Louise so much that when she was trying to raise funds to buy a property at a very low market value, Louise convinced her that she owned a property in Denver that was passed to her when her husband had died. She said that now she had been released, she was allowed to sell the property, and when it sold, she would help Margaret by investing in her property scheme. With this generous offer from her friend, Margaret purchased a property which came with very strict payment schedules. Louise continued to live with Margaret, and in early May 1944, she met an elderly bank manager named Lee Judson, and a week later, they married. This, however, violated Louise's parole conditions, so they agreed to keep the marriage a secret. Louise spent the next few weeks staying at the Logans, or in a hotel with her new husband. She was still trying to convince Margaret to send Arthur to an institution, and at every opportunity, she would tell friends and neighbours about his deteriorating condition. Margaret was now being pressured to close the real estate purchase, but she did not have the funds as Louise had not produced any money from a Denver property. Margaret was getting very worried. She was looking after her husband and now had the added stress of losing money by failing to complete the purchase. Things then got worse as Louise tried to cash a cheque for $200 by forging Margaret's signature. Margaret was getting very frustrated with her friend and asked her for a meeting so together they could go through all of their finances. On May the 29th, 1944, Louise told her husband to stay at the Glendale Hotel while she went out to Margaret's home to discuss the money issues. Two days later, Louise and her husband moved into Margaret Logan's house, but Margaret, was no longer there. She wasted no time in convincing the authorities that Arthur needed to be committed to a specialist facility and on June the 5th, he was taken to the Patton State Hospital. When friends and relatives visited or phoned the house, Louise gave them a well-rehearsed answer as to why Margaret was unable to talk to them. She told them that Arthur had bitten his wife so seriously that her nose had been disfigured and she was too upset to see or talk to anyone. As time passed, less and less people inquired about Margaret Logan. Six months later, on December the 6th, 1944, Arthur Logan died, and Louise instructed the authorities to use his body for medical research, saying that this is what Arthur had wanted. Louise was now 64 years old, and she thought her plan had come off very well. Less and less people were inquiring about Margaret. Arthur had died and she was living in the Logan's house with her new husband and spending their money. She had forged Margaret's signature on the parole reports and sent them to her parole officer. However, things were not as cosy for Louise as she had imagined. Her parole officer had noticed that Louise's parole reports did not look quite right. So she showed them to the chief investigator for the district attorney, a man named Walter Lentz. After looking at the handwriting, he took no time in concluding that all of the reports since June were written by a different hand. They immediately reported their concerns to the district attorney, who instructed homicide chief Thad Brown to investigate. He discreetly spoke to Margaret and Arthur's friends and neighbours, all of whom told him that they had not seen Margaret for many months. When they spoke to the nurses at Patton State Hospital, the nurses told the investigator that Arthur was admitted in June 1944, and during the six months he was there, 
He did not receive a single visitor. Thad Brown thought that it was now time to pay Louisa visits. And in the evening of December the 20th, police arrived at the house. Louise repeated her story about Arthur biting his wife on the nose and the neck. And since Arthur died, she said that Margaret will not sleep in the house. Thad Brown didn't believe a word that Louise was saying. She admitted forging her parole papers, but insisted it was only because Margaret was very anxious at the time and instructed her to do it. As the questioning intensified, Louise said she would no longer talk to anyone except the Los Angeles County Sheriff, Jean Biscaylis. So accompanied by officers, Louise was put in the police car and taken to the Hall of Justice to be interviewed further. Meanwhile, the police continued to search the house. Thad Brown looked at the garden and noticed a plot of earth bordered by flowers and at the end there was an avocado tree. He instructed his men to start digging and very quickly they saw what looked like a human foot. As they continued to carefully dig, the rest of the decaying body was uncovered. Margaret Logan had been found. Louise was then taken back to the property, but she would not look at the body. By this time, reporters had found out about the discovery and had gathered outside the house. It was late, nearly midnight, but the Logan's garden was illuminated with lights as the police continued their work. Louise continued to be questioned by Sheriff Biscaylis and eventually made a statement. She admitted burying Mrs. Logan's body, but denied she had murdered her. She said that Arthur Logan had beaten his wife and then shot her. When she managed to restrain him, she was going to phone the police, but thought that due to her previous convictions, no one would believe her. So she decided to bury her friend in the garden and get Arthur committed to the state hospital. The search of the house continued and police found a revolver with the initials EBL. This later turned out to be the gun that had been stolen from Louise's previous parole officer, Emily Lathan. The crime looked virtually identical to the murder of Jacob Denton. Louise was arrested and the following day, her husband Lee Judson, humiliated and heartbroken, took his own life by jumping down a stairwell. The trial of Louise Peets began in Los Angeles on April the 23rd, 1945. Prosecutors told the court that Louise had killed Margaret Logan in order to gain control of her finances. They showed the jury that consisted of 11 men and one woman, the transcript of Jacob Denton's trial, which highlighted how similar the two cases were. They also produced a string of witnesses, all of whom were able to describe Louise's strange behaviour since June 1944. The defence told the court that Margaret had died by her husband's hand and Louise merely panicked, which many people would have done in the same situation. This time, Louise insisted on taking the witness stand. She spoke in a very articulated way and did her best to charm the jury. She was a calm, incredible witness, coming over more like a favourite aunt rather than a lady on trial for murder. On May the 31st, the trial ended and the jury took three hours to deliberate before returning to find the defendant, Louise Peet, guilty of first degree murder and the judge sentenced her to death. For the next two years, Louise protested her innocence her lawyers applied to the court for an appeal, but each time the application was denied. Louise Peets was eventually executed in the gas chamber at St. Quentin State Prison on April the 11th, 1947. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case. <laughs>